Online Voices and the 616 Company presents The Book of the Unguided, Canto 3, by Darren William Pierce, based on an original story by Richard Hunnison, narrated by Adam Baer. Prologue Gaia I blink just once. Time seems to stand still. Balanced on the edge of a razor blade of shattered memories. I do not remember much of my past, if anything at all. Most of it appears locked behind a door, protected by a veiled and somewhat distant hazy dream. And no matter how much I focus on that dream, I cannot push aside the mist long enough to get a clear picture. As soon as I manage to break up the mist that cloys my senses, wraps my mind, it slips back in to obscure everything once more a few agonizing seconds after. It has been like that my entire life. I find it upsetting and sad at how I came to be here. I was found wandering the city of Zion, lost, alone and confused, like a bent double old person, whose fractured delusional mind pulled them from place to place. I was the proverbial stray cat that just did not know the way back home. I drifted this way and that way, through streets that I did not know, through alleys that I had never seen. I was not even sure I had a home. The mist and barrier was that strong. I was, however, fortunate and thankful. Fortunate that Zion was inhabited by such good people. These days it breaks my heart to think of them especially that fine couple who saw my plight, opened their hearts, took me in and did all the things they could to make my life tolerable. I was dirty, they cleaned me. I was ragged, they clothed me. I lacked belongings, they gave me everything. These people cared for me deeply and genuinely. I truly thought I was happy and I owed them so much. They even began to take steps to find out where I came from and who my parents were. I watched them go out into Zion daily to see if they could track down any kith or kin of mine. Days passed. They scoured the kingdom's register of missing people to see if I was listed. Their search was not fruitful. So, after a long and hard time, they came to a decision, one that I did not expect. They adopted me. They claimed me as their blood kin and became like a family to me. I remember this with a mix of joy and a pang of sorrow. Who was I? I would catch myself looking at my reflection in the silvered glass of a mirror. Peering back at me was a twenty-something ash-blonde beauty of a girl with shimmering blue-green eyes. Under the left one I observed a blemish. I would turn my head left and right, this way and that way, to view myself completely. I would smile. She would smile back. Yet, I was perplexed. I was caught in an endless cycle of wondering just how I had been created and why my parents, my biological parents, abandoned me. It was mysterious, intriguing, and totally frustrating. Nighttime was a mix of terror and understanding. Though my sleep never lasted for long, the night terrors came thick and fast, 
and whilst I got glimpses of my presumed past in these dreams, I would be torn away and thrust awake by the most harrowing nightmares a young woman of my age could ever experience. I would snap from those monstrous mind-rending scenes, scream myself awake, and open my eyes as I lay drenched in sweat. I tried very much not to sleep in those days, and I could exist with very little I found. I began to realize that I was somewhat special, that I was different to my adopted parents. I kept that a secret. I did not want to worry or burden others. I just wanted some kind of answer and a resolution to the images that troubled me deeply. I knew little of my own history, so I focused on Zion. I found mankind interesting. I studied them through their works of literature. I spent hours and hours in the libraries, buried in the books that had been crafted in their age. I learned of the twin rulers, those who inherited the throne from Zion's old king and royal bloodline. It was said of them that they had been abducted by angels, no less banished from the realm, and had been gone from the kingdom for close to a thousand years. I was always skeptical. I preferred hard evidence over hearsay and speculation, which seemed to drive those of Zion. Yet to every legend and myth, there is a grain of truth. So perhaps the accounts were true and not just edited or altered by the flow of time's immemorial river. Everywhere I looked, I saw traces of the twin rulers who had left their mark upon the world. They were beloved, they were adored, and they were almost perfect according to mankind's texts. Their rule brought about the most glorious and productive days of our great nation and society. I, for one, could not wait for their return. I secretly hoped and yearned for it. I found myself obsessed. Perhaps this was unhealthy. I didn't know at the time what I know now. I discovered more about them. One was clearly the more tolerant of the pair. He was a diplomat and a fine orator. The other had a spark of darkness about him, or at least danger in those eyes. They were both said to be fair and strong leaders, but one was definitely the yin to his brother's yang. They appeared to be a match made in heaven, created to balance each other. Where one was strong in some skills, the other lacked. Where one was weak, the other had those skills and abilities to compensate. Together they appeared to be inseparable, unstoppable, unnaturally so. The deeper I dug and the further I delved, the more and more I came to the conclusion that there was something extraordinary about the pair. Of course, this at the time seemed like fancy, and it was mainly a notion that there were pieces of the puzzle missing. Parts of the story that had not yet been recorded, perhaps. It all seemed like a young woman's hope, a fairy tale. Yet, I was ready, if they did return, to use my proof to shine a light upon their potential nature. They were not just common royalty, I was sure of it. I dug deeper and deeper each day. I was ready should they return, even though a millennia had passed like sand in an hourglass. I wished for the return of that kingdom as I watched my own tumble toward a terrible conclusion. You see, in the twin rulers' absence, there was a long line of new rulers, so-called Prime Ministers of Zion. Our current Prime Minister was an engineer before she took a dramatic U-turn into politics. And with a certain ruthlessness and aplomb, she was able to swiftly navigate up the ladder of power until she reached the very top. With her rise to power, she brought with her that background in engineering, 
that drive to constantly push production and enhance productivity. So, with that in mind, she channeled a lot of her technical knowledge towards problems, and in doing so, she set us on a course toward a new frontier. She granted unlimited funding to certain research facilities in the pursuit of this goal. She offered lucrative deals, opened doors, closed others, and attempted to ensure a rise in standards for the everyday citizens of Zion. It was an admirable goal, and we did, in truth, face global crises upon this world that required swift and sensible solutions. What happened then? Well, I watched Zion's people turn their eyes towards the heavens. They looked to other planets in our solar system and the resources that might be there to keep our mighty oversized city functional. We consumed resources like locusts and needed more and more day by day. Our leaders, including the Prime Minister, knew that we would need to push our technology further than we ever had before to reach those places. We had no chance of reaching that goal. Not with the ever-present will of the sky above, which glared down at us with arrogance, envy, and a desire to control. I discovered later on this truth. Seldom do the high heavens align with our own notions of what we think is right, or what our collective destination as a species might be. It was no different this time, and the high heavens had been watching. Our desire, our lust for technology, and will to wrest control of our fate from them, initiated our imminent doom and sealed our fate. Or, should I say, their fate? Mine was different. Upon that fateful day, I chose to buy new sandals and take a walk through the city. I was upon the streets of Zion when the first of the bombs hit. I saw the sky pucker and then a flash of white and gold. There was a crash. Then. Mushroom clouds blossomed in the sky all around me. I witnessed the panic, heard the screams as the people began to run and flee. It was no good. They were not prepared, and they were not ready for the death that followed upon her pale horse. She was a swift rider as well, cloaked in the clouds of radiation and fire that spread wildly through Zion in an instant. A bomb landed close by me, and I knew my time had come. There was a flash, a blossoming flower of radiance. I saw people raise their hands before their eyes to block out the light. I could see their bones through their skin. People's skulls collapsed in the shock waves so that they resembled Neanderthals and some victim's skin melted away from the bones like it was wax. Some had their skin merged with the textures of their clothes. I could see the pattern as clear as day as the light faded. One woman stumbled as her legs gave way, her face completely erased from her body, as if it had never been there. Then, a sound came after like the laughter of a booming god. It was followed by a wave of force that brought with it a tremendous firestorm. I turned to face it, threw my arms out wide, and felt the shock wave tumble past me. My friends, my family, my people were blown to ash and flame in an instant. But not me. While I felt the terrible heat and the radiation that crawled all over my skin like bullets made of thousands of angry ants, I was unharmed. My mind opened. I felt the sensation of thousands and thousands losing their lives in a brief second to the devastating fireball that raged around me. 
it felt like a deep stab to my heart. Yet in the midst of this chaos and destruction, I stood untouched, barring a slight tan upon my skin. With fire-brightened hair and a lack of clothing, which was scorched off of me in a mere instant. I was alive, naked and alone, but alive. It was a bittersweet moment. On one hand, I survived a cleansing from above, and on the other, I lost everything near and dear to me. I walked the city in despair. My eyes fell upon the ruin of survivors who swapped instant annihilation for a slow death by a poisoned atmosphere, tainted water, and radiation sickness. I tried to help, and I was able to save some people, but this was not the end of their suffering or mine. They were in incredible pain. I could feel it as if it was my own. In the days to come, they would begin to suffer organ deterioration and worse. The woman with no face scrambled around for a rock with which to cave in her own skull. Then, vile machines made their appearance, along with horrific vehicles of destruction. They arrived to both destroy the weak and enslave those who survived their purges. I did not look back. I could not yet fight them. So I did what anyone in my position would do. I ran. I careened from one city block to the next as fast as my legs would carry me. But I tired quickly, and the machines caught me. Since they were relentless, they did not tire. I was surrounded, thrown to the ground, and captured. As they led me away, still naked, I stared into their soulless eyes. Mechanical, red, unblinking, unfeeling. Yet somehow I knew what they were, what their code was. It was programmed to hate us, to hate every single fiber of that which we call humanity. They were pure evil. I knew this, and over the next few days, I learned to my horror just how evil they were. I was shackled, tossed into a cage, and left to sit for days. Those around me, the struggling survivors who had exchanged one horror for another, were taken away one by one. I would never see them back in their cages again, as they were taken away into that darkened corridor. I would hear screams, terrible ones, pitiful ones, begging and mewling. Then all would fade to silence, and another prisoner would be taken from the cells. No one was fed, many starved to death, and some ended their own lives choosing to hang themselves with strips of cloth torn from their own clothing. I did not blame them, and I felt for every single one. The dead were discarded by the machines when discovered, taken away, chopped up, and fed back to their captives. As I watched others go mad in that regard, I was thankful that I was never that fond of food, even when I had a family that loved me. I was certainly not going to devour my own kind, even though some of the other prisoners began to become savage and do just that to their fellows. I had but one tiny sliver of hope in a way, and it came from a small window in the wall. Sometimes, when the clouds parted, the sun would come shimmering in all its glory through that gap and come as my only reward in these days of deep suffering. Many more days passed. They all blended into one. I found my hope began to fade. It dwindled for every lost second I had been placed in this hell. I could never get used to it. 
Then one day, my turn came. The cell opened and my weak, naked form was grasped in the cold by an unfeeling, clawed hand of a mechanical jailer. I was hefted up, carried like meat through the dark and cold corridor. I was taken down past the shadowed hall and ultimately shoved into a room where I was roughly strapped onto a brutally cold and blood-stained examination table. Hope fled me here, for this place looked like an abattoir. Traces of where my fellow prisoners had met their grisly fate were all about. Upon the floor, the walls, even the ceiling. I tried my best not to gag. I thought that this would be my end as well. The jailer, who was a bulky mechanical drone with goat-like horns, surveyed me with his hateful red optic eyes. He bore an animal-skulled head over the metal and was adorned with sharp, brutal-looking weaponry, including a vicious bayonet. He looked me over once more and then turned to leave, closing the door behind me with an audible clang. The iron smell of blood did not bother me, oddly enough. I became used to it from all my days in prison. This place was saturated with it. The scent permeated every single molecule of the room, and I could smell it all around me. I was left alone for a long time in the darkness. Then I heard it, a mechanical breathing. Suddenly, some kind of machine respiration in the dark as a being came into the room with me. This creature was biomechanical. I could see traces of humanity that clung to the metal as it combined with flesh there. He wore a hood that framed his mask, a mask that was set with one baleful red light optic. He was like a comical yet bizarre doll a patchwork machine man that I was both fascinated by and yet hated intensely. This patchwork mockery disgusted me, and for the first time in a long while, sorrow was replaced by anger. Abomination, I thought. He scanned my body thoroughly and then selected two sharp-looking instruments. I thought this is where my story might come to the same bloody end as that of my fellow captives. But I was wrong. Yes, he hurt me. He made a few precise surgical cuts, and we both observed how the blood flowed from the wounds. He initiated further deep scans of my body, and then examined me very carefully. He repeated the process of cuts and examinations several times observing, and then scanning. This pain was nothing. I withstood it with ease. It was equal or perhaps lesser than any torment I had endured in the cells before this table. He regarded me, and then looked straight at me as his red optic light burned brightly. Then, without a single gesture, he left hastily as the door slammed shut behind him. I was sure I would have bled my life out there and then, were it not for the medical drones that returned to patch me up. They sutured the wounds and gave me a course of injections. I was given some new clothes and then taken to my cell to be caged like an animal once more. I began to construct a potential image of this place from the fatigues I'd been given and the designs around me. It appeared to be a bunker of some sort, an old military facility retrofitted to the needs of these machines, whatever they were. My torment did not end there, no. I was taken from that cell day by day. They performed experiments on me that I will not detail. Each time they were different. They were designed to test something about me, some hypothesis that the machines had. They tested my body, my mind, and perhaps they even tested my soul. I did not break. I would not break. I was alive. They kept me alive 
patched me up, and they kept me going. What did they need? What did they want? Why me? Sometimes they would perform tests so horrific they would actually send me to sleep. This was both perplexing and disturbing at the same time. Still, I did not bend or break. I had no idea what they were searching for and what they wanted to discover. Gods know, I tried to work it out, but I just simply could not. This was too big for me, too complex, too harrowing. After a few more days, I noticed that I was the only one left in those cells. Was I the only person now alive in this bunker? I was taken back to my cell again and again. Yet one day, something changed. I was looking at the sun as I always did when the clouds were being fair. Suddenly, everything turned black as the night. Then it became day again moments after. I heard gunfire, explosions and more followed. I came to a very swift conclusion, locked as I was in that cell. War had come to these machines. I hoped with a fierce swell of a volcano, help would find me and free me. Part of me dared to hope that the twin rulers came back to rescue me. Yet I dared not think it. I changed from the woman I was. I was harder, like steel. The abuse I suffered altered me. So I did not think of fanciful things. I waited. Waited for the machines to come and drag me off again. They did not. No more experiments happened from that point on. The drones sat outside my cell, constantly watching, but did not approach. So, I peered and peered out of that little window on the world to see if I could make sense of the turmoil outside. There was no end to it. The sky changed from night to day several more times. More explosions, more gunfire. There was no ceasefire, and as I watched, I saw the sky light up brighter than ever before. Something that was neither a bomb nor explosion came soaring down from heaven. In the hardened shell I had become, my heart dared to skip a single beat. I lost count of the days at that point. The war seemed endless. It raged on and on with fire and loud sounds behind my tiny window. Yet I was not complacent. I knew that the machines could come for me at any moment, and I began to become ever more watchful. One night, in an apparent lull in the fighting, I was drawn to a shadow that moved through the corridors. It effectively slipped past the drones and moved like a ghost in the dark. I was fascinated by it, and I dared to hope that this being might be a savior to free me from my torment. I took my chance as the being came close enough to my cell. I made just enough noise to draw his attention. He stopped, came closer to my cell and looked in. I could see he was no human. He was something else and I beckoned him to move into speaking range. He did so. I asked a simple question. Are you here for my rescue? He shook his head flatly, but then replied, I am rate CLXV double I. I am not here for your rescue specifically. My mission is a covert one. I seek intelligence on a potential breakthrough in the ongoing war. My commander and king assigned this mission to me. King? Was this THE king? The one I read about? The one I hoped it would be? Is this the ruler of Zion who has been gone a thousand years? I heard myself ask. Great CLXV double I nodded. 
He gave me a sympathetic and comforting look. Then suddenly, a moment's decision seemed to pass across him. He unslung two powerful-looking 50 caliber handguns and slid them across the floor of my cage. He put his finger up to his face and winked. Then, with a single motion, he was gone from my sight as silently and as quickly as he came. Wraith might not be my liberator, in that he did not directly open my cage, but he gave me the tools to do just that. I now had hope, pride, and a pair of custom-augmented death-dealing firearms that would aid me in my escape. It was time to leave the filthy confines of this cell and get out. I just needed the right moment to present itself. I was sure that if I secreted the guns rather than using them outright the moment I had them, I would be able to do just that. Thank you, Wraith CLX VII, I whispered to the shadows. I owe you my life, and possibly my sanity. I began to plot, plan, and wait out my captors, carefully hiding my new friends away from their prying optics. I longed to send a bullet or two straight into the primary biomechanical cortex of the bastard surgical robot who had been my tormentor for so long. Not yet, not yet, I told myself. Soon. A few more days passed, a few more hours, a few more minutes, and then two drones stood outside my cell, confident in their position and my apparent meekness that they dared to turn their backs on me. I slipped the guns into my eager hands and felt the pressure of the metal against my palm and fingers. I took a slow breath and stalked these pair of machines, like a cat hunting in the semi-dark. Slowly, I approached as far as my chains and shackles would allow. I stopped and watched them for signs of movement. Then, like a cat again, I decided that I would play with my prey. My weapons lifted slowly and aligned with the backs of the guards' heads. The red dots from the laser sights settled against their mechanical skulls. Yet I still didn't fire. I crossed my arms, as if it was somehow right and proper to do. Perhaps I was mimicking some of the things I had read about in books, or perhaps I just secretly hoped I looked stylish. I imagined myself as an angel of death, and this was their punishment for imprisoning me. With each steadying breath, my anger grew, and with a single slow press of the trigger, I felt a shockwave rock up my arms. I could handle it though, and the bullets flew true. They exploded with a satisfying blast, even though the violent recoil threw the guns up, making a second shot impossible until I realigned both. The effect was magnificent. The two drones fell before the weapons with a rocking motion and flopped to the floor face down. The backs of their heads were ruined, so I fired again into their bodies and held the recoil this time. It was a spectacle. A ballet of bullets, sparks, fluid and shredded metal. Satisfied that both were out of order, I knew that it would take a monumental effort to get the piles of junk running again. Now, I sought escape. With some finesse, I was able to bring one of them closer, purloin his key, and open the cell as well as my shackles. Freedom was mine, and at long last, I was on the right side of the bars. Thoughts of freedom were exchanged now with thoughts of pure escape. Not just from the dark corridor, but from the whole facility. So with great haste and without looking back, I fled into the depths of the shadowy corridors. I had to explore the facility to find an escape route. I knew there were more drones in there. Then there was the machine that had cut me, 
hurt me and tried to examine and break me. I wanted to find that bio-abomination machine and end it. My explorations of the facility led me down corridor after corridor, room after room. Many told the same story, the same macabre tableau as I searched them. The machines and their operators had all left for the front, it seemed, leaving the remains of their experiments. Discarded, mutilated humans and partly built biomechanical monsters decorated all the rooms I entered. This would have shocked me had I not already suffered enough to harden me like steel. I found a partial map of the base, studied it, and then set off down other corridors. The bunker was like a labyrinth of interconnected rooms, corridors, passageways, and access tunnels. It made my head spin, and at one point I stumbled onto a pair of additional drones. They trained their weapons on me, but did not fire. They sought to recapture me, and one moved in to try and seize my arm again. I did not allow it. I opened fire with the first gun, point blank, right into the center of his mask's optic. The red light shattered. The same sickly fluid poured out and I shot again. The third shot was with a second weapon, and that took his companion out of the picture. With both machines ruined beyond repair, I was able to step over their sparking corpses and head on my way. I felt good too, better than I ever had in a long while. In my flight, as my feet took me past a room, I stopped and looked in. I hit pay dirt. I found something that would really put a dent in things. This was a fusion reactor, the facility's source of power and an excellent tool for my revenge. I wasted no time at all entering the place. I went right over to the operations panel and studied it. I read a heck of a lot in my time, as you know, so I absorbed a lot, tech manuals included. I went through different scenarios in my head. As I looked at the panel, each one became clearer and clearer to me. The cooling system seemed the best shot. I knew how to override it and break the safety lever at the same time. I weighed my options at that point. Would I get out in time? Was it worth it to break the machines once and for all and blow this place clear off the map? I made my choice. I was about to pull the lever when I heard a sound that would have chilled me to the bone before my change. Now it was a sound that banked a relentless anger and revulsion. A low, methodical and mechanical breathing that echoed through the room as my tormentor entered through the big door at the rear of the chamber. He fixed his baleful red eye upon me and began to advance. He put himself between me and the panel. Then, for the first time ever, he spoke. We are alike, his digital voice intoned. You are as human, or as less human than I am. He taunted me as I ducked his grasping, clawed hands. You will see in time, he promised. I was angry, and the more he spoke, taunted and riled me, the more my anger blazed like an out-of-control fire. I waited for the right time, which happened when he lurched forward. I fired right at his head with a fearsome crack. The shot dislodged the mask he wore. It blew it right off and clattered, smoking to the floor. Beneath the mask, there was a human face. Bloody, pulpy flesh covered with small wires and a patchwork of tiny connectors. Some poor soul had been salvaged to make this monstrosity. This leering, jeering tyrant who could no longer hide behind that mask. It is all interconnected, you and them. 
patchwork man said. You will find out the truth, but you will be too late. I did not know what he meant, but I knew that I was furious. Fury blazed in my heart like a sun. I heard him speak of a higher being, his so-called master, and that the world was already on a collision course into ruin. It was apparently a very long way into the cycle of its coming demise. Project Gaia. He raved, and that name stung. He tried to catch me, but I circled around him, taunting him with my agility against his bulk. I wanted him to feel as frustrated as I did when I was a prisoner. Then, when he made one desperate lunge at my shoulder, I twisted to the side and fired twice. One shot went into his leg, which buckled. The other went into his hand, which shredded into a shower of sparks and flying metal. I was where I wanted to be. I kicked the lever to the cooling panel and set the machine to overload. Before he could react, I sprinted to the other side of the room. He futilely reached toward the lever, laughing horridly as he did so. My shot rang out and took both his middle finger and lever straight off. Smoke pooled from the end of the gun and I reflexively spun it in a move of pure arrogance. He tried to convince me that my actions were further hastening the world's demise. I slipped out of the door and shut it behind me. Then, with a blank look, I shut the controls that kept the door from opening. He was now locked in the room, caught like a butterfly behind a thick glass-fronted fire door. I saw his whole demeanor change as I saluted him through the explosion-proof glass before I was off into the facility once more to seek my way out. I stopped running, recalled the map I had seen earlier, and walked on. I remembered the bombs in Zion, how they had no effect on me. My escape became a steady journey until I found an exit and felt the air on my face. I was outside and I could have cried, yet I did not have time for another explosion blasted through the air to my back. A blinding light blossomed behind me. It was a deadly flower of radiance that caused my own shadow to deepen and the inky blackness to grow darker in it. Then there was a soft pop. Moments after that, a violent shockwave tore through the facility that I'd left. It obliterated everything in there, all the remaining machines, their experiments and their knowledge. Everything that place ever was or ever would be was wiped out in a blink of an eye. I walked through the remnants of the shockwave from the blast. My arms were by my side and my guns were still held in my hands. My hair was caressed by the heat and the fire as the storm behind me raged on. I was untouched as before, unharmed and invigorated even. I wanted to believe that I'd bested the monster that held me prisoner, but somewhere inside my mind there was a nagging doubt, a doubt that grew into a festering sore of realization. I had not seen the last of that bastard. So be it. As I walked from the ruins and emerged elsewhere, the memories of the life that was taken away from me left me feeling assaulted. I was called Mary once by my adoptive parents, their friends and their family. I was loved, cared for and cherished. The machines labeled me Project Gaia. The creature called me that in our first real clash. I wondered what it meant and what I really was. Suddenly I began to realize as time passed in that cell and chamber, Mary died long ago. 
in the claws of brutal experiments and surgeries. I am Gaia. I am on the hunt. And I am finally free.